I do indeed have the honor and the privilege of introducing our guest speaker, who, of course, <laughs> who is speaking up from the back wall. Because she really needs no introduction, so welcome to the Historical Society and Bobby Joe Fan Club. Um, we had a th theme of lumbering last meeting, and the theme continues tonight, I guess. Um, once upon a time, there was a very prosperous village and town just to the east of Belleville called Deserado. It was founded in 1848, and uh, uh, became very prosperous within a hundred years or 50 years actually had grown to over 3,000 people and then about a hundred years ago It started to go into decline because the trees at the Rathbuns were cutting down or disappearing and so it uh, fell into some uh, uh, decline and uh, So that's what we're going to hear about tonight and so the person who needs no introduction is the one and the only in the incomparable, if comprehensible, our very own Bobby Joe Morris. Take it away, BJ. Yeah, I will. <laughs> when they put the advertisements out, they put it as Billy Joe Morris. So I had a lot of emails and phone calls saying, Bobby Joe, was it or Billy Joe? For the people who don't know my family. I'm like, no. So anyways, I got, finally got a hold of Richard and, and then I phoned the radio station myself because <laughs> I didn't want to hear Billy Joe Morris anymore. And then they also said, swing. I'll be swinging my presentation. So I had people saying, Wayne's world. Wayne's World, swinging. You're going to swing your hips. I'm like, yeah, every, every slide I'm going to swing. So, <laughs> but anyways, I'm going to be talking tonight about Deseronto. And what I've done is before and after pictures. Um, I grew up in Deseronto as a young child. And then I moved to Shannonville when I was about eight. Um, nope. This is, this is Deserano now. Everybody's laughing and smiling and happy. So I'm going to be talking about the Rathbun. Have, has people heard of the Rathbun family? Okay. They were a lumber, a lumber tycoons from um, Auburn, New York. And they had the vision. They actually, it was Edward that had the vision. His father had the lumber mill and he come up when he was 20 years old and expanded. So they use the, the sawdust with all their companies. So they made the terracotta in br brick. So they would use the sawdust to, and the clay to make the terracotta. So this building right here, see this one right here? So that's what's left. There was a fire, and the fire literally took out all the businesses down along the water. So there's before in 1891, and now 2017 when I went and took the picture. So there's a map, and all these lines that you see are railway tracks. Deserano downtown all along the water was railways, railway tracks that the Rathbuns built. Um, you gotta remember it was horse and buggy back in that day. So this is the number two down near Karen Brown's Antiques. And this is what it looks like now. So this all burnt. The terracotta was built in 1887, and they employed 40 workers. It was destroyed by fire in 1898, so it only ran for 11 years. That's my little car. And I just want to show the people that the railway tracks 
were torn up in 1982. So there we are on the number two, going towards the reserve if we were, if we were going from Napanee, and this is uh, the boundary road. So the terracotta was right here. So there's examples of the cat terracotta. You can find that all over along Deserano in the old buildings. You can find it in Tamworth. You can find it in Kingston. Uh, if you really start looking at the buildings. And these, this picture was taken two years ago. And it's still like it was when it was made over 100 years ago. So this house here on, the on um, Green and Thomas, it, it's the one house in Deserano that has the most terracotta. I was so happy when I seen this. But it's all over the place. And the, the reason why they bought that house was because of the terracotta. They thought it was pretty cool. So they would, so I don't know if it's because of the sawdust that was mixed with the clay, but that would produce more heat. There's another place on the number two. You got the lion's head, you got the symbols. This is in Napanee, just up the road from the hospital on the north side of the road. You'll see this, it's got the, it's got the ladies' heads. And Tamworth, this was the Rathbun residence in Tamworth because he had mills all over the place. And that's the house beside it. And this was the hotel across the road. Now it's an antique place and a restaurant and a store. So because I said the Rathbuns, they used, they used everything. They didn't waste nothing. They used everything. They used all their waste. So we have the chemical works. The refuse burner is where they burnt the sawdust. And then they made their own sawdust charcoal. So they would, that would be used for barbecues and stuff like that. So there's the kilns. That's the chemical works. See the little men? They're huge. So this is, this is a road right here now. I'm going to show you a picture. So all these pictures that I've taken, I've taken the before picture, and then I went, where is, what's now there? So this is what's there now. So this house was built in 1987. She's a teacher in Napanee. And because I always ask for permission before I go on someone's property, I just don't go on your property. But the lady beside it, I didn't know I was on her property and I had my camera. She come out and she got quite upset with me. And um, she goes, what are you doing here? And I said, because I had a camera. And I said, well, I'm taking pictures. Your house is on the old chemical works. And she goes, I don't think so. And I said, well, <laughs> I got proof. I've got <laughs> maps and I've got pictures. So she, she was actually quite upset with me. So I went back and I showed her. So this is and that's her house there. So, and there's old gas pipes here. So she was want, she wanted to know why these pipes were here and I told her why and then I explained to her, your area is where they dumped a lot of the garbage, like the leftover. <laughs> so <laughs> she said every time she digs up flower beds, she finds glass, she finds brick. I said, well, that's why. So I wasn't trying to be mean or rude. I was giving her the truth. So that's the, that's the backyard of the lady. <laughs> when I showed her that picture, she really didn't like it. So there's nothing I can do, but yeah. So if I come to your house <laughs> and you lived on an old dump, I'll let you know. <laughs> so there's another picture of the refuse burner. Like I said, this is where they took all their sawdust. They didn't want no waste. They used their waste. Um, when they had the fire, 
There is, if you, if you ever go in Deserano, you'll notice there's no third street. And that's because when they had the fire, they didn't, they didn't redo it. So you have a first, second, fourth. So the third street did not go all the way up to the number two. It only went up to the main drag. So the Rathbuns had their own flour mill. They were the first um, flour mill to have a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Rolling mill in Canada, which I find, which I found very cool. So if you're in that area and you see crown jewel flower, that's the Rathbun flower. So there's the, the kilns, the chemical work, and there's Third Street. So I went to where, and the fire destroyed. The fire took, destroyed all of, mostly everything downtown, because it was all wood, right? They had a lot of wood. You, you'll understand when I show you pictures of what the downtown along the water looked like. So I got a, a Google, I Googled it, and the third street is not on there. It's right here, it would have been right here. And there it is, and there's Steven's place. <laughs> So that's the kind of stuff you would see all along the water. So you can understand why it just kept burning and burning and burning. Even the Catholic Church burnt. <laughs> and this is the old railway track. As a child, I used to ride on that, but I didn't know I was riding on the railway track, which is kind of cool. Oh, that's another view. So again, there's along the water. This is all wood. And this is the, if you understand, like these are all railway tracks. So the railway tracks went all around Deserano. Can you imagine going out there with a, <laughs> a metal detector? You'd probably find a lot of nails. So I, I always wondered what this building was when I was a little girl. And I had I just about when I found out that it was a, a butcher shop. And I'm like, oh my God, it's apartments now. So there it is now. So so does anybody know what the term sod means? Sod? I don't, I'm asking. Sod off? No? Does anybody? No? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm asking. Okay, I'll let it go then. <laughs> Talk to me after. <laughs> All right. So there's the cedar mill that was down, down there. They made rail, cedar rails. They made fence posts. It employed 145 people. They made shingles. And they made railway ties. That's what it looks like now. So from that booming business, because of the fire, to that. There's another picture of the cedar mill. Another picture. You can see the man standing right there. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of wood to burn. That's just a picture I threw in there. There's another picture of the cedar mill. You can see the horses, the horse and buggy. Can you imagine the horses having to climb over all those railway tracks all the time? And then the Bay of Quinney, the Rathbuns had their own railway line, so they made their own cars. And that's what it looks like now. So you go from that to that. There's a load of railway ties on there. Can you imagine how hot it'd be in there in the summertime? So I wrote, there were no vehicles back in those days. Horses, boats, railway cars were the main means of transportation. So 
there's another aerial view of what it looked like with all the with all the lumber. So that would be all hand bomb. That's a lot of work. So the car works. They made their own engines in Deserano. They 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 were self sufficient with everything. They made what if they needed it, they made it. Um, there was a lot of engineers in Deserano. And that's what it looks like now. So you go from that to that. There's another picture. That's the cedar mill in the background there. They made snow plows. That was for the CN, CNR. This was made for Oshawa. They made rail cars for Oshawa. And there's a streetcar. They made streetcars. And there was 17 made and sent to Montreal. And the big town of Deserano did that kind of stuff. There's another type of streetcar. And there's the kind of engine they would make. So this is the Bay of Quinney railway line. So they, I'd like to know how they did it, but they got permission to, you know, to go through people's properties. And they went up to Harold Smith, and then they went up to Tamworth, to Tweed, Marlbank, as far as Bannock, Bannock Cockburn. This is Naylor's Theater. It's still, the building is still standing, but the building is empty. The building was built in 1892. You can see the terracotta along there. The building was built on a slant because they used uh, all the property they could in those, in those days. Um, the designer who designed this building was the same architect that designed Landmore House in Babel. It seated 400 people on the bottom and 150 people in the balcony. There were two VIP rooms and five dressing rooms. The man responsible for starting this theater, his name was Thomas Naylor, and he was born in Deserano on October 31st. 1867. His family owned a bakery, and that's him there, that's Thomas, and the sewing in Deserano. During the 1890s, Thomas began giving ballroom dance lessons and became involved in booking vaudeville acts for a number of venues in the area. So they had vaudeville in Deserano. Here's another picture. Now they, as Jim Kennelly was saying, they used to hold temperance meetings in there. Yes, they did. So there's some more. You can see the terracotta up here. There's another. That's pretty cool, eh? It's, it's, the nose hasn't fell off. You know, you can still see your face. It'd be interesting to find out whose face that is. I'm just going to say it's Bobby Joe from now on. <laughs> Or Billy Joe. We'll call her Billy Joe. <laughs> so there's the side of the building. Everybody's heard of Lower Secor? Well, the man who, in, who was the founder of Lower Secor was born in Deserano. His name was Frank Patrick O'Connor. We have the O'Connor Tea House in Deserano, and there are, they are family members. Yep. When he was 14 years old, he quit school and he went to Peterborough, worked for General Electric, um, started a candy business in Peterborough, downtown. He wasn't successful. It was called Elizabeth Best. Um, he met his wife. What was her name? Mary, Mary Ellen Hayes. He borrowed $500, moved to Toronto, 
and started the Laura Secor factory. He, married, he moved there in 1912 and started the Laura Secor company in 1913. Does anybody know why he called it the Laura Secor company? Well, Elizabeth's best was named after the, the queen, Elizabeth, and he named Laura Secor after the heroine of 1812. That was his home. And then it became, when I was younger, they call it the Hilton because there were so many hills, eh? <laughs> A lot of hills lived in that apartment, so they called it the Hilton. Yeah. Baz Otto, on uh, number two, owned the building, and he had it torn down. So that's what it looks like now. So from that to that. And that's the O'Connor Key House right here. So if you ever go down there, they have delicious meals. So that's the back of it. And that's what's there now. And that's him. And here's his house in Toronto. And it burnt. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to bring that bull tonight, but I didn't. Um, I have two of these bulls. I found them in Kingston. The lady wanted $300 a piece. I got one for 180 and the other one for 150 Jamie. So I may, I may donate one. <laughs> It's just like a berry bowl. I've got, I've got one down actually at the store. Have you got the Flapperton bowl? I'm going to show you the mark to look for. So there's some workers, a lot of women. Um, this picture was taken in 1920. Uh, it was that they employed, Flapperton employed 35 people. It was destroyed by an explosion on June 18th, 1931 at four o'clock in the morning. They did not rebuild. Mr. Clapperton moved back to Toronto. So there's the mark to look for. It's at the bottom. Clapperton, he used to be with a, a man named Gundy and company. So you may see two C's and a G in a company or just one. So this one is, is not as old as if you had two C's. Okay. So if you got them, that's what, they sell, that's what they go for. They're quite expensive because the, the business was only there for what, 13 years, right? There is a plate. That's a little nappy. That's not very big. That's like as big as that. And Karen's asking $45. but there's the mark right there. It's in the middle of the bowl. So if you guys are looking, don't look at the sides, look in the middle. The Mechanic Institute, which are I call the first libraries. Deserano Library traces its roots back to the freedom, to the foundation of Deserano Institute's Mechanic Institutes in 1885. The Mechanic Institutes were used as libraries for the adult, for men only, and it provided them with alternative pastimes to gambling and drinking. They, they were only open on Tuesdays, Saturdays from 7 at night till 9 at night, and Thursdays from 3 till 5. Ontario had passed Free Library Act in 1882, the first of its kind in Canada, which allowed municipality, municipalities to establish libraries supported by tax do dollars rather than membership fees. So it's ironic that the Mechanics Institute was here. They, like, apparently they rent a room and then the library's there again after all these years. It's over here. When I was a little kid, it was a bowling alley. So this is a picture of this bank being built. It's, at the present time, it's empty. 
um, CIBC closed, closed its branch. So there's a picture of it before. It used to be called the Standard Bank. There's a picture of the bank inside in the 20s. And there it is there, 82 to 94. I remember going in and Phil, I still have some of those slips. <laughs> I kept some. <laughs> so there's Monica McGinnis. She had 10 children and she still worked. This is the, the post office. It was built in 1901. It had the same architect who designed the first parliament building in Ottawa. As per maps in Deserano in 1875, the original post office was on Mill Street down near the water because there were the, 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 main, the main means of transportation back then was waterways. The building provided accommodations for the custom services, the Indian agent, living space on the third floor for an employee or the caretaker. The clock faces on all sides, so the people who were around the area could set their clocks. The Bay of Quinney limestone, it was, bay, it was made of Bay of Quinney limestone, and from Kingston, they got the white stone. Then you had the customs house because they exported and imported from um, places all over the world in Deserano. They've added an access ramp here. These are the views when they were building it, what it was going to look like. And this is the, when they imported and exported goods. So there's where the imports and exports would come in, right here. And there's a train. But if you see here, see all the railway tracks? That's a lot of wood to, to do by hand. So this is the Indian agent office. Yes, we had an Indian agent in Tynanaga, or on the, in Deserano, on the reserve. 1885, Canada institutes a pass system to force First Nations to stay on the reserve. The Indian agent would issue permission slips to, to leave the reserve. So up to 1951, the natives who resided on the Tainanega territory had to ask for permission to leave. Even go to Balbo, they, they were not allowed to leave. For more than 60 years, many indigenous people had to get approval to leave their reserve across Canada. That just wasn't Tynanaga. Aboriginal people didn't receive the right to vote until 1960. They could if they forfeit their status as a native. They were not allowed in pool halls, liquor stores, or public dances. Police could demand to see their passes if, of any Aboriginal person that they saw. So if they were in Balbo, a police officer could go up to that person and say, let me see your pass. The pass system was created in 1885 because of this man, John A. MacDonald. It was enforced, really enforced in 1940s and the 60s, the 60s scoop. If you haven't heard about that, it's a very interesting to read about that. And they did away with the pass in 1951. So that's, to me, that's 75 years of abuse. But there's an example of a permission slip to go hunting. They weren't allowed to sell their goods off the reserve. They had to have permission. So there, I just threw this picture in because I thought it was cute that all the boys had hats on. This is Mally's General Store, it was also um, uh, with the pharmacy. And this is gone now. But if you're ever down in Deserano, this, there's terracotta in this building as well. So there's a picture of downtown Deserano. This was the first bank in Montreal. 
It was built in 1904. It's still there, but it's covered with something. And then they built this bank of Montreal. Now it's a town hall. But they closed its doors in 1932, and all the customers went to CIBC. Okay. So there's a, a note. I didn't realize until I did this research that all the banks had their own money. So there's a Bank of Montreal note. There's an Imperial note. Now you know why they have such big safes in their banks. So the Queen of Canada, the Queen of England, that family there, they um, issued said that their their money was going to be used all across Canada. So that's when they started this in 1944, that all money used across Canada would be Bank of Canada. So if someone says they have a Bank of Canada note from 1901, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is Hugo Rathbun. This is the gentleman who, who were, the, who were the, the father of the two gentlemen, the other boys. But he wasn't the first man to come up here and start the mill. It was his brother Amos. And he and two partners bought the mill from his brother, and then he brought up his sons. They were from Auburn, New York. Mr. Rathbun paid his employees with his own money. So you could take that voucher and go to any of his stores and, and buy stuff. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he get, well, I suppose if he asked for the money, he would give it to you, but... This is what he gave the people. So this is a picture of Mill Street. This was Hugo's home at one time. There's the Arlington Hotel. And there's Edward. This man, this, he was 20 years old when he came up here to Canada. And uh, this man had the vision. He's the one that we're going to use all our waste. We're going to open a chemical plant. We're going to open a sash and door factory. We're going to open this. He just, he, just, he just went crazy. He opened everything. There was his house. His house, he wanted to be here. This is on the main street. Mally's is right here. So he could see all the work along the water. That's where his home was. So his house would have been right here. There's the park, the Central Park is still there. Hugo wanted that for his wife. So there's a map of the Rathbun residence and there's all the train tracks and all the buildings that were there. They even had a turnabout, a turnabout for the trains. So there's Frederick Rathbun. He was the treasurer of the Deserano Council and he was a postmaster. He was the president of the Mechanic Institute and his house became apartments. It burnt down in 2008, so not that long ago. So there's pictures of the sidewalk that's still there. And if you came up this hill on Center Street, it would be right on the corner. There's another building on the main street. And I never noticed the terracotta until I learned about this. So now I really look at the buildings. The old library. And this is St. George Street. And that's what St. George Street looked like before the fire. There it is again, another view of the west side. And that's what it looked like. There's another view of St. George Street. And there's that side. Now there's Bocart. 
These guys are twins. Alfonso, Alson and Alzon, Alonzo, Alonzo, and their little brother Fred. Doesn't look very happy, does he? <laughs> and then when this fire, there was another big fire in 1898, and St. George Street was consumed by the flames. So all that was gone. So there's Stover and Sager. Sager is a common name still around that area. Not, I don't know any Stovers. There's a picture of the mess. And there's the Arlington Hotel. There used to be a house here that was attached to the hotel at one time. It was originally called the Empress Hotel. And when I was going around and taking pictures, I heard them up there banging. So I yelled up and I said, can I come up and take pictures? And he said, what for? And I told him what I was doing. And he said, sure. So I went around back. I didn't go up these stairs. But that's what it looked like before. You can see here with the round window. See it there? And that's a door. So I went to this window. There's the inside of it. And there's the door. That would have been the door. Looking out. He's redoing it. He wants to update it and make it back into a hotel. A lot of fishermen in that area. So that's going down the hallway. And you'd come out that door. And there's a picture of when the house was attached to the hotel. So if I was looking out that window, right, this is what you would have seen back in 18, 1892. And then it looks like this now. So it all burnt away. Apparently, the smell of the burning lasted years. Because that's a lot of fire, right? That's a lot of chemicals that burnt. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of wood to burn. So there it is again. And there it is now. So there's a Deseronto train station that was right across the road from the Arlington Hotel. There it is over there. Oh, and there's a ticket. There's an example of the ticket, the Bay of Quinney Railway Company. That was in 1905. And there's the, the post of when the, um, the last train of the Rathbuns ran. And that's in Deserano. That's up on um, Boundary Road. I have to take a picture of that. This is the sash and door factory where they made windows, they made, they made church pews, they made, they made so much. And when I was, because when I do the research, I went to Queen's University, I went to York University, and when I was down at Queen's, I found their catalog, the Rathbun catalog. Oh, I, I was like, you know, tickled pink. So there's a picture of it there. They shipped their goods all over the world. They made moldings, they made staircases, they made church furniture, they uh, made bay windows, fireplace mantles, broom handles, and blinds. This plan at the time was the largest slash, sash and blind and door mill that shipment to all that shipped parts to all over the world, and it became a weekly thing shipping their, their goods. This company employed 145 people. So there was an example of the stuff that they made. So when I was seeing all these, I'm like, I wonder what those numbers were. Well, I found out what the numbers were. That's what all the numbers were. So it was a price guide. That's in 
another picture. There's another, another picture of Mill Street. There's a sash and door factory here. There's the Arlington Hotel with the house. There's a map. So the only thing that's left down there that of the Rathbun Company is the old drying kiln, which became Canada, uh, Canada Optical. There's, their, there's the picture of their catalog. So this is their big mill. They're, this is what started in Deserano. It was built in 1849 by Amps, Amos Rathbun. And then that's when the village was known as Mill Point. Mill Point was one of Ontario's earliest company towns. In 1872, the original um, sawmill burnt and they built this one. This one's built out of brick and stone. According to the Napanee Beaver, the enterprise had 575 miles of limit retail yards throughout Ontario. So they got their lumber as far as oh, London. So they had the rights to get the lumber as far as London. Their steamships were fueled with the wood waste brought in by conveyor by the big mill. The mill closed in 1916 and the Rathbun Company officially retired in 1923. So there's the park over there. It was full of wood. There's the sawmill workers. They don't look very happy. <laughs> there's even young children. There's another view. Can you imagine all of this burning? Imagine, I don't know how, how long it burnt for. It'd be interesting to find out if, the, you know, if it burnt for days, right? So there's the lumber, um, the Rathbun docks in 1819. And this is the drying kiln. This is the, what's remaining down there of the, the Rathbun industry. And it looks like this now. So I, I was lucky when they were doing some work in there. Um, the, big ho the big pipes are still in the walls and they let me take pictures. I'll have to add them to this. Oh. See the little man there? <laughs> There's Naylor's Theater right here. So these are examples of what they did. Railway ties, railway ties, fence posts, telephone graphs, hot poles, packing boxes, broom handles. Yeah. But they kept their money in the town, right? So. There's another picture. So. This was how it, this, they even had stables. They had stables all over down in Deserano. And the locomotive shop, the original house of the Rathbuns, the turntable. And this was Rathbuns' first office. It was down near the water. And then they built this, their headquarters. Now it looks like this. It's gone. So the Flying Corps, they took over the building when the war was going on. There's the shipyard. There's an area view of that building. And this is what it looks like now. It's gone. But I always wondered what this was, you know, and then when I start looking at all the pictures and going over it, it was like, wow, we had a lot of, we had a lot of industry down there at one time. So there's no more shipyard. 
So has anybody heard of Snake Island? Okay. Well, it was also, we called it Snake Island. Um, I remember my dad telling me, him and a, and a guy named Wayne Tugwood, who's a lot bigger than dad, went over there and they said they walked into the middle of the island and then they turned around, there's a whole bunch of snakes and dad had to carry Wayne on his back. <laughs> back to the water. Yeah. Yeah. I won't go over there, I'm too chicken. <laughs> but I, wish, I would like to go over there maybe someday. So there's no buildings on there now. But the foundation is still over there, apparently, and a few snakes. So there, there's Dr. Aronia Decca, and his, his baptismal name is Peter Martin. He was the, the sixth son, I believe, of, hold on here. Oh, I can't find it. He came from a big family. He was put in the mush hole. Do you guys know what the mush hole is? Residential school? Um, he was there until he was 15. He, um, he was taught to be a shoemaker. He went to school, he went to college, he went to university, and then he went to medical school and became a doctor. He was the second doctor in um, Ontario to be native. The first one was from New Credit, and his last name was Jones. There's the orphanage. They turned sod in 1905, and it was open for operation, no, 1903, and open for operation in 1906. Each corner, let's see, there's, a, there's another picture of that. like now. So each corner was fitted with the battlement towers and the center tower rose 80 feet. This was the orphanage. They got its first intake. Um, she was a little girl. She was six. You had to be four years old to go into this place. And she came from England. There was only 23, 23 or 29 children that did live there, and then they closed up its, they closed up its doors. <laughs> now when they purchased the, land, the, the island, they, um, because it was full of black snakes, they released a lot of pigs to kill the snakes. There's a look a little bit there. But look at how close you are to the water. So this building here so would be looking east if you want to know where that building look, was on the island. It would be facing east. There's the hall. There's all the men with their mustaches. There was a picnic. It's quite the place. Oh, the regalia, not just a... There's the wigwam, his place. Another house. And there's the side of his house. Now I was told by a friend that this table, and she just passed away, her name was Aunt Edie, that was at her place. Quite the place, eh? This was just their cottage on the island. <laughs> this is not where they lived all the time. Oh, a bandstand. And they had a boat like this to go to the island, to the mainland. But I just can't get over how close they were to the water. So this house here is called the Pines. And um, I know the people who live there now, it doesn't look like this now. They've taken a lot of parts off the house 
but you can still, you can still see the, the little how it's raised here. There it is there now. So when I was in there, I was asking Shelly. I said, Shell, I said, I, do you mind if I take a picture of your staircase? Because I heard that the only thing that is original to the pines is the staircase. So there's another picture. But you see this part right here? They still have that. So they let me take a picture of it. There it is there which is kind of cool that they still have it. But they said they were going to put it back up. And there's their staircase. That's the only thing that remains the same in the home. Beautiful, eh? So this is Napanee. This was doctor's home in Napanee. And this is the rock hut. So if you go up the hill, this is the number two going to Kingston. So that's what it looks like now. There's a picture of his funeral. It was quite the funeral. And the Rathbuns, with their wood, they even made matches. They made their own matches. Yeah, to start all the fires, eh? Yeah. It was sold to EB Match Company, and I just found a box, EB Match Company in Smith Falls, and they even have, I should have brought it, but I didn't. They even have the tax, what they pay on it, three quarter of a cent. <laughs> so when this was burning, Randy Brandt, who's passed, was telling us the day it burnt, they got everybody up down on Bayshore Road and all over Deserano, and they did a bucket brigade. So he said they had to go over the train tracks and down to the water with buckets. And they just went back and forth and back and forth. So that's what it looks like now. So from that, so you see where the building is? still remains of the building is at the corner of this place. And there's a map of it. Yeah, there's that tax. So they must have raised their, raised their taxes, eh? Because it was three quarters of a cent when it was E.B. Yeti. So I don't get this, no after the low. <laughs> So there's a picture, it's the community center now. So that's what's there now. And then Deserano had its own ironworks. It wasn't in operation very long though. Um, 1903 is when they stopped and then the building burnt in 1908. So they made pig iron here. And that's, that's rail cars go on that, eh? Oh, so there's a Deserano Public School. So in the old days, if the schools had two stories, that means it was quite the town. Because there was a lot of just one, one room schools back in that day. So there, oh, there it is there. And then they built the new public school. So the old school was right across the road. And then there was the Deserano High School. I lived in that little one. And my brother and I, these are staircases up here. We used to run all around, because I was like five, and we played Nicky Nicky Nine Door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in the basement is where the, the, you could do laundry and we would roller skate all down there. So, and that's it. <laughs> Joe, what an excellent presentation. And I'm glad that there was two of you providing that, you and Billy Joe. 
because you gave us double double value for that presentation. I've often I've been to Desrama many times in my life, and it's uh, if no one's ever been there, you should go there. It's it's a little hidden uh, diamond in the rough. There's great examples of architecture and old buildings. You walk around that town, and you know at one time there was great wealth. So thank you for showing us this. We're very familiar with the Rathbun Company, but not only did you take us to the Rathbun Company, you took us to Terracotta Pot, you took us to Laura Secord, you took us to the banknotes, you took us to the Indian Act, you even ended up taking us back to the post office. So what a great town Deserano is, and you provide us a great example of why history can uplift us and make us proud of our roots. So thank you and congratulations for your presentation tonight. What a finish, eh? You, you leave, leave it up to uh, Bobby Joe. Bobby Joe. Leave it up to Bobby Joe to uh, put on quite a show for us. Uh, obviously, you've, you've put so much work into preparing this. This is an immense, immense uh, uh, task. And, but, uh, you know, we've all been to Desirado any number of times, and, you know, we see the town, but it's quite amazing to imagine, you know, what it was and what, what life was like at the time. So anyways, that, that's our event for tonight. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. We'd ask you to stay, socialize. Uh, you can you know, ask questions for Bobby Joe uh, and have a cup of coffee and a, a biscuit. We, uh, we have uh, Miss, Mrs. Christie made the biscuits for us tonight. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no need to rush out. It's cold out there, so you can stay and, as I say, have a little visit. Uh, now we, we have our next public presentation in January. Uh, so you know, we'll see you then. Uh, and uh, thanks for coming out. Have a, have a good uh, rest of the evening and, uh, and uh, enjoy uh, what you've learned tonight about Desirado. Thank you. <laughs>